Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Katerina Pasadomo. I am the Southern Foodways Alliance Associate Professor of Southern Studies and Anthropology at the University of Mississippi. And on behalf of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture and the UM School of Journalism and New Media, I am pleased to introduce our presenter, Lindsay Gilpin. Ms. Gilpin is the founder and editor-in-chief of Southerly, an independent nonprofit media organization that covers the intersection of ecology, justice, and culture in the American South. Ms. Gilpin was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, and has just recently returned back to Louisville from Durham. She is a reporter and editor who has covered climate change, energy, and environmental justice movements across the United States. Her work has appeared in Harper's, The Daily Beast, City Lab, High Country News, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, Grist, Outside, Inside Climate News, and more. She earned her master's degree from Medal School of Journalism uh, at Northwestern University. Today, Ms. Gilpin will discuss how Southerly came to be and their mission to collaborate with local news outlets and other organizations to bring more accurate and thoughtful storytelling to the region, especially its rural, low-income, and BIPOC communities. The title of Ms. Gilpin's talk is Southerly, How Collaborative Storytelling Makes Communities More Resilient, Healthy, and Equitable. We invite you all to ask questions during her presentation using the Q&A box, and I will pose them to her afterwards. So please join me in welcoming Lindsay Gilpin. Thanks, Katarina. That was a lovely intro. I always regret putting like all the places I've written for on those because it sounds ridiculous when I like, hear them rattled off. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, I am so excited and honored to be uh, presenting here. So thank you all for coming and thank you for the center for having me. Um, it's just it's just so awesome to, to be able to, to work with you all. So I'm going to, I have a PowerPoint uh, here and I will sort of flow through that and you know in the next 30 minutes and then hopefully have a lot of questions from you all. Um, that's my favorite part of these is just answering questions and thinking on the fly about uh, you know how journalism cha is changing and how the South is changing, and so I'm really excited to to hear what you all have to say and, and things that you all are also thinking about. Um, so please put those questions in the in the Q and A box. All right, I'm going to share my screen here, and present. Okay, so. Obviously, this is <laughs> Southerly's logo. And if you didn't know, our logo is, this is Kudzu. A friend of mine drew our logo a few years ago when I launched it. And I have a, I think we all probably have like a love-hate relationship with Kudzu. It's an invasive species, see it everywhere, but it's also, you know, it's everywhere. It's a very um, Southern landscape um, image. And so I, I sort of have a an affection for it, um, which I think is sort of symbolic of, of the South. Um, and as Katarina said, we cover ecology, justice, and culture in the American South. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, if you don't know much about the things we're covering here. So um, Southerly, I just thought, thought I'd put this here to talk a little bit first about what we're doing. Um, we cover uh, everything, environmental issues in this region um, and how they intersect with public health, economies, the environment, um, natural resources, like everything that could possibly um, come into contact with, um, with, with environmental issues. And we really do a lot of partnerships and have been focusing on that more in the last six months or so, especially during the pandemic, to ensure that the stories we're producing actually get out to the communities that we're writing about. Um, and I'll, again, talk a, a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And, you know, the ultimate vision, I think, for Southerly is really to uh, build a more healthy and just and equitable place to live. I mean, this, this landscape is changing, this region is changing, um, its demographics are changing, um, climate change is, you know, we're bearing the brunt of climate change and um, all of that, that's a lot, right? And so um, I am very passionate about journalism's place in, um, in making sure that communities are safer and healthier and more beautiful. So 
So how we define the South is um, these dark green states that I've blocked out right here. Um, that's really our coverage area, which is huge, as you might imagine. We don't cover all of Texas because that's just an undertaking that I'm not quite ready for. <laughs> but we do a lot of partnerships in East Texas. And we're really interested in covering the global South, I think, in the future. Um, you know, not just Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands, which I'd love to cover more in general, um, but the global South as a whole um, is, you know, and really, the, especially when relation to climate change and immigration and migration. So, I started Southerly as a newsletter in December 2016, and I was out west working at High Country News, and it was during the presidential election, uh, or campaign, I guess, and I was doing a lot of investigative journalism. I had moved out west from Louisville and thought I would be out there for, uh, I don't even know how long, I, a few years at least, reporting. I thought, you know, to go out there, I had, I wanted to be a big time environmental reporter doing a lot of investigations and I was um, really in it and loved high, high country news. Um, but during the election, um, the campaign and the election, I was sort of watching from afar how the South, as many of you probably were too, um, how the South was being treated, you know, blanketed as Trump country, particularly Appalachia, um, because I'm from Kentucky, because my family has roots in Eastern Kentucky and Appalachia. And um, just really getting frustrated with, you know, the people, the reporters parachuting in, posting up at diners or gas stations and um, acting like the, that this, this region is all one place, it's a monolith. Um, and you know, that's been happening for a really long time when it comes to environmental stories. You know, we, um, you know, a lot of journalists come after the, you know, it, whether it was the BP oil spill or a hurricane or, you know, some other chemical spill, it's always like after these huge events, um, you know, people rush to cover it and particularly related to industry um, and then leave and don't return. and. Uh, I sort of got fed up with that idea and moved home to Louisville way sooner than I had sort of anticipated and started freelancing for all those places, um, the national outlets especially, to try to get more stories about Southern communities and their relationship to the environment in, in major news outlets. And then I started to as a newsletter just to see if people would be interested in a publication that really focused on that relationship. Um, as you all probably know, there's a lot of media in this region about that cover food um, and culture and music and all of those things, right, are wonderful and incredible and um, huge parts of, of the South, but, um, you know, so is land and relationships to land and, um, and how to protect that. And so um, I launched the website in July 2018 um, and we got, this is a little more than you need to know, but we had a fiscal sponsor as a, um, uh, nonprofit um, under another organization, and then we got 501c3 status last year. Um, so that was really exciting. So this is sort of like a, that's me four years ago presenting the newsletter, which was on Tiny Letter, which is no longer a thing, um, at like a West Virginia media conference. And I was just like, hey, I have this idea and I do this newsletter every week. Um, and, you know, people were trying to pay attention to what I was writing. I was sort of like writing essays and like curating news that I saw that was important throughout the region. Um, and then in 2019, um, you know, we published like one story a month. Uh, it, we didn't have, you know, it's always been, you know, our first series of stories when we launched was, you know, we just got like a small $5,000 grant and we put that all towards reporting. And I reported half the stories and then paid the freelancers to do the rest. And, um, and then in 2019, we just kind of had some, some donors that were contributing monthly and uh, started pushing that and then just published a few stories. Uh, and then last year, um, this is sort of an example of our homepage. Um, and it, we started publishing three to five stories a month and, um, and it's been growing from there. So just a couple of quick facts. Like right now we work on like $120,000, which if you know anything about media, that is literally nothing. <laughs> so it is, it's very, very lean uh, organization. And um, I, you know, I have up until a few months ago when I got a fellowship through Stanford, I've been, um, which I'll talk about, I was, you know, freelancing still and working a few different jobs um, and just trying to pay, um, pay freelancers mostly to do, do this work. So we're publishing one to two times per week. Um, and environmental justice has really become like the central 
central theme in all that we do. Um, and we're, you know, we're still completely donor funded. You know, we still, we get grants from um, foundations and, and really working towards that, but we are very much reliant on like community members um, throughout, especially people in the South that are living in the South or from here, um, donating to support our work. So um, this is our part-time staff right now. So me, um, uh, about a year ago, almost exactly, I hired Carly, who um, is our Gulf Coast correspondent, and she covers really, you know, all of the Gulf Coast states um, and has been doing some incredible work I'll talk about this past year. Um, Cameron, who is a Duke student, um, since I was in Durham, I worked with her and she's been doing a lot of our social media, marketing, that sort of thing. And then we have um, Co, who I just hired in January and she's based in New Orleans also now. She's from Mississippi and she's um, our contributing editor, which has been awesome, helped immensely um, and is just really helping our capacity and bringing in new writers too. And we focus a lot on paying people fairly because as you might know, um, if you're in the journalism world at all, uh, freelancing is not a very lucrative trade. Um, so paying people fairly, paying people on time, uh, making sure we're prioritizing um, uh, writers of color, um, women, um, LGBTQ writers. So really proud of like creating uh, an organization that centers that. Um, so some of the, um, I'll just talk for a second about some of the things we're covering. So like I said, we take a broad look at environmental um, topics. So that ranges uh, from, so the top corner with the I am a man uh, poster, it was a, the hoppers, uh, the garbage um, collector um, or sanitation workers in New Orleans went on strike last year and we did a photo story on that. Um, we, we do a lot of stories on industry in rural communities um, and especially um, communities of color. So the man in the middle, it's a, it was a story for, about a pipeline um, that's actually trying to be routed through Memphis. Um, we've done a lot on coal ash cleanup workers and that power plant is a TVA power plant in Tennessee. Um, and then of course, a lot on um, sea level rise and what that looks like, especially along the coast. Um, and then the woman in the cemetery is um, a chief of a tribe in um, coastal Louisiana. And we talked to her about sort of solutions that they're working towards to, to protect a lot of their sacred sites. So like I said, we really um, ranging, uh, ranging here. So, um, and again, some more stories and we're really trying to move towards solutions oriented work um, because I think it's so important that people, and, and not just me, <laughs> this is not my idea, but like it, it's so incredibly important that people, especially in this region, especially in the rural parts of this region that don't often get coverage um, of, of their lives and their challenges that they're facing, like see themselves in, in our stories. And that has become more and more important to, to me with Southerly as, as we've grown. Um, so we've had, uh, one of the stories we published last week was on this, um, these grocers in Pensacola that uh, live in a food desert. And so they've been starting up um, cafes and grocery stores that are more affordable than like a Whole Foods, right? Um, we've had, uh, you know, a, the pandemic for all of the horrible, horrible things that have happened has really sh shed light on the importance of telling stories at the intersection, I think of public health and the environment. You know, it's it's really like a practice run for a lot of what's going to happen with climate change. You know, it's the, the people that are most affected are um, black people, indigenous people, Latinx people. Um, and and it, it is really important to show how those dots are, are connected. Um, and we also do some kind of fun stories like the kudzu thing here um, and some local things like what um, you know what communities are doing to push back against industry this one was about a hog farm um, or I'm sorry a landfill and in hog farming in their community in rural North Carolina and I'm happy to talk more about um, these kinds of things too in the questions so this is sort of the crux of this talk and why I titled it what I did. Um, you know, Southerly's audience is, you could say it's, you know, it's huge, right? Like it's, we cover 12 and a half states and, and want to cover more areas. Um, and so, you know, we were aimed at people living and working in the American South, um, but we always have enough context where 
anyone who reads it could, um, you know, if they're, whether they're in Washington or New York, um, could see it and understand what we're referring to, the places we're talking about, that sort of thing. And the other part is really connecting the dots between different parts of the region. Um, one of the things that I've seen so much in my career is that um, in places that don't have consistent news coverage or, um, or you know, attention on them, often that people often feel isolated in their challenges, right? They feel like they're the only ones having to deal with a particular company or really um, high energy bills or um, pollution in their water or whatever it might be. And the reality is, is that so many places are facing these problems. It just manifests a little differently, right? It looks different. It might be a completely different population, but if we can connect the dots more um, between all these people sort of that you see here um, in my like, um, you know, hand like scribbled um, web that we can show that they're they're more connected than they think. Um, and so the priorities are rural residents, um, you know, across the digital divide, and that has become even more important um, in the last few months in, in what we're focusing on because so much so much of the South is rural and lacks um, lacks news coverage. Um, BIPOC communities, students and teachers, citizens groups, local policymakers, so that we can actually see the impacts of, um, of change on the ground, right? Uh, oftentimes it's hard to understand like what, how federal policy trickles down to affect, um, you know, a rural Mississippi community, right? It just doesn't feel like it matters. And, and I understand that frustration that people have. And so really, um, focusing on local solutions um, and then what the you know fed, state and federal solutions can do to support that is is important. Um, so this is uh, the next couple of slides I want to talk a little bit about um, news deserts, which is you know places without news outlets, particularly papers. Um, so this study, um, which I can um, send the link to after this, but it uh, really it's, it's an incredible study of news deserts in the in the US, but you know, this, the South tends to have more lost paper, have lost more papers and have more counties without newspapers than any other place. And I think that that is, um, it's just so telling about what's happening. So here's sort of an example. Um, I was in Durham, so I've been doing a lot of work in North Carolina. These arrows are the counties that I'm focusing on. The red is a, are places without newspapers, like don't have a community weekly, don't have a daily. Um, and, you know, they'll have the TV stations maybe, but though usually those are places that cut like stations that cover, you know, um, two to three counties uh, and just cover the biggest stories. So um, that those are our focus areas. And obviously that makes the work really hard because especially because there's a lack of internet in a lot of these places. Similarly in Louisiana, this red county um, it, and the kind of like medium green ones um, next to it are some of the, this corner of the boot, if you will, is um, was hit really hard by hurricanes this last year. So we focused a lot of our um, efforts in reporting on this, these communities in a few of these parishes in the corner of Louisiana where there's just not a lot of news and not a lot of coverage. Um, I wrote, I, I write about this a lot. Um, it's something I just like yell about all the time. And I, you know, the, there's a lack of coverage of environmental issues. And I mean that broadly, like about justice, about energy. And, um, you know, there's a declining number of print outlets, like we talked about. There's also the shifting balance of news, um, uh, you know, corporate media's, you know, McClatchy and Gannett are buying up more of these papers um, and cutting staff. Um, the smaller papers are sometimes very conservative and are basically just like acting as press machine, like re press release machines for industry in the area and pitting economy versus environment. And that's just not, that's false. It's just not true. And so unpacking that has been a really important part of the process of what Southerly is doing. Um, so the big picture is how can we, and this is what I've been working on in my fellowship for the last um, year in reaching rural communities. How can we better reach rural Southern communities and work with them to address environmental and public health issues through journalism and journalism adjacent things? So, you know, to do that, we need to build trust because there's just a huge lack of trust um, for a good reason, you know, for communities that we've talked about that like have 
been burned before by the media or just never see anybody's face come cover the challenges they're, they're facing, or they're just constantly fed misinformation by politicians, by industry. Um, and as you all probably know, uh, what, you know, is the case at the, you know, what, whatever Southern governor, Republican governors say, for instance, isn't necessarily what like doesn't show the picture of what is actually happening on the ground. It's just so much more complex than that. And so really making sure that we tell these stories thoughtfully and fully and in a way that um, they're constantly appearing in local news spaces um, and, and doing so in ways that make sense for the people that live there. Um, one of the things I have to talk about is that it doesn't always make sense to write a 3000 word investigative story. Like most people, especially if they're working two jobs and trying to like put food on the table, don't have time to read that. And so the, the way that I've been thinking about journalism and, and this, there's so many outlets doing this across the country is um, I think the difference in us is we're just covering like a huge <laughs> swath of, of, of land and trying to do this in many communities is um, making sure that it's more accessible. So we've done like more Q and A's with community leaders. We've done um, workshops uh, like this one, this unearthed North Carolina to train people on how to um, write about environmental justice. And we've been doing more um, kind of like resource guides, information sharing, because a lot of people keep saying that they just need basic information and not necessarily like um, long stories. So we're trying to meet that need where it is. So this is how we're doing it, right? Um, so part of my fellowship is uh, is basically, um, and it ends in May, so I'm really sort of like in the thick of it right now, um, is creating a project that is kind of an experiment um, and really reaches rural communities of color. So I focus on those North Carolina counties that the arrows were pointing to a couple slides back. And we created this newsletter on the left is, um, uh, kind of, I just talked to the library director, um, multiple community members, the NAACP chapter who's quoted in this um, and decided like, here are the main things that we need to talk about in this community. So COVID-19 vaccines obviously is a big one. Um, we the back of it has um, information about solar because it's growing and there's a lot of misinformation about solar farms in the area. Um, it also just links to, um, links and like um, a QR code so people could scan it and find it to like the YouTube channel where the county commission meeting is posted because people are just having to dig for this information or they're not able to find it. And um, we really, it, it just, it needs to be easier than that. And that's the job of journalism. You know, it's not always like, it's not as sexy to do this work um, than it is to, you know, do like beautiful investigative reporting, but like to get to those beautiful stories, to get to the stories that like are long and, and complex and can really tell the full, um, the full story of the place, we have to first meet people and reach them and then give them the information that they need immediately, right? And then we can kind of focus on the bigger pieces that they're working with. Um, Another example is this series we did on hurricane recovery in Southwest Louisiana. And um, this has been awesome. We just, Carly did this incredible series um, that I can put the links to in the chat uh, and did a community forum with like some of her sources. And it was like mostly Louisiana people that showed up in this Zoom. And now, and this is sort of like a mock-up, but we're making a zine uh, kind of with things from the stories packaged together and then um, adding resources and distributing it through the homeless shelters and mental health clinics in the area. Um, because one of the things that we keep hearing through all this is people are really struggling with mental health after the hurricanes and during the pandemic. Um, a lot of suicides, a lot of, um, you know, just calling suicide hotlines, that sort of thing, and just like seeking out therapy. Um, so that was one of the needs we've been trying to meet. And again, it's all sort of an experiment. Um, we're also big on partnerships, um, and this is growing too. So we have a lot of local news partners across the states. These are my two dogs. <laughs> I just thought this photo was too cute not to put in this presentation. Um, and then we have long-term partnerships that we're creating. So one of them is in Lase Latino NC, uh, which is a Spanish language outlet in North Carolina. And we are uh, working with them to do some community organizing and reporting on um, specifically around farm workers, um, 
and poultry workers in the state and also just rural, rural Latinx communities. Um, regional partners, yeah, you might know Scalawag um, facing south and um, national partners too, because it is a, a platform for us to get more information out about what, what is going on in this region. And we're doing more and more um, events and partnerships with um, local community groups. Like I was saying, this library system in North Carolina, the mental health clinics, um, workshops, like media literacy kind of stuff to, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that in journalism, we're having to like back up and and start over in a lot of ways because we've lost so much trust and because we've you know journalism has disappeared in so many places that um or just never been there to begin with that um we kind of have to start at the beginning and do these one-on-one -on -one conversations and so before the pandemic we were doing a lot of the what this picture shows like what's important to you let's talk about it and we've done a few of those on zoom but obviously in person is way better so we're working on that um, and then the resource sharing too, this is also a kind of like the newsletter I described, but really showing up um, in a way that helps like we did one on the um, how to protect yourself from and others from COVID if you're going to the beach right or like resource guide for hurricane preparedness like things that people have to search really hard for on the internet. So we there's a lot of Facebook groups, for instance, that um, we're sharing the, the hurricane one. Um, as a PDF, and then you can also print it out. So we're kind of, it, it's sort of a work in progress um, that I'm always happy to talk about because it's it's really fun. And I think it's, um, it's important to figure out different ways to tell stories. Um, sustainability, um, you know, how do we make Southerly last? And I think that's, you know, that's the question. Um, we have to make the case for environmental journalism as a vital community service. And that's really hard because there's so much mis misinformation out there about environmental issues, about climate change, about all the things that we're covering, especially in the South. And so we're up against a lot. Um, so we're doing this in a few different ways. And, and one of them is trying to kind of combine. Um, I showed this because I, <laughs> I just like showing the process of how I come to these things because it's just, um, you know, I'm just learning so much as I go. And one of the things is really partnering like or, or ensuring that we're having journalists and community organizers work together in tandem. So the, what we're moving towards is really like not just publishing journalism just for the sake of publishing journalism, but making sure that we're a platform that works with local news outlets, whether it's a Gannett newspaper or a public radio station to not only better report on the environment because most of them don't have the money or time or experience or space to do that, but also they can, um, they can, um, we can help them do the community outreach part because what I'm trying to fundraise around basically is, is um, hey, like Southerly knows, knows our stuff when it comes to the environment. And we also are really close with specific communities and we wanna do more on the groundwork. Um, and this is like some kind of a reckoning that is happening in journalism in general is, you know, it's not always for communities. It's very extractive. It's um, kind of journalism for the sake of journalism. And, um, and that I think more and more people are getting increasingly frustrated with that. There's really good examples um, like Outlier Media in Detroit, which is like a text-based service or um, uh, Free Press, which is in uh, New Jersey, I think, and in, in North Carolina, and they do a lot of community organizing. So trying to like really partner those things so that we can actually see change happening on the ground is something that I'm really, really excited about. Um, and so we have a membership program where people can donate and we're also looking at like donors um, and foundations and that sort of thing in the different areas we work in. So we're prioritizing like the Delta, Appalachia, the Gulf Coast, and also sort of like North Carolina, South Carolina, Atlantic Coast states. Um, and so all of this leaves me and probably you <laughs> with more questions than answers. You know, what, what does it look like to be a sustainable new media organization? It's just, especially nonprofit, it is so difficult. And um, and time consuming and energy consuming. And every other week I'm like, I'm gonna quit this, I can't do it, you know? And and then, you know, I get a phone call from somebody that's like, oh, let's do this newsletter in North Carolina. Like yesterday, a guy called me from the NAACP and said, um, we wanna make this a thing. Like, I'm, I just need to get more information out to people. So like, let's partner and do this again and we can distribute it through churches. And, um, and he wants to focus on like food drives and food banks and 
mental health. And so it's like those moments make it worth it. But in the long term, like what, what does it look like? You know, do we become a cooperative? Could it be community owned? Like that's a, a movement happening in journalism. How do we monetize like partnerships and syndication? How do you measure impact? Like, how do you make sure that a, a rural Alabama community, for instance, in like Lowndes County can um, actually is getting more information and is using that information to say like improve their sewage infrastructure or push their local county commissioner to do something or voting more often like how do we measure that impact like it, it feels it's hard to think about and hard to scale but I think that that's the only way that we're going to improve um, improve the case in a lot of or the situation in a lot of these places in the south especially as climate change makes all of this more complicated um, and then also, you know, will journalism <laughs> support this kind of work? It's just a really, you know, this stuff is, this is the hard, this is the hard stuff. And this is the, um, the work that takes up, that is very slow moving and, and takes a lot of us to do. And like I said, we see this often, but I, um, I think with environmental, um, with environmental coverage, it's often like kind of siloed or an afterthought. And now we're realizing, especially in the South, that it's touching every aspect of people's lives. So how do we make sure that it's we're doing that in journalism as well? Um, also, I just wanted to put up before I wrap up and take questions and stuff. I, um, you know, this is our website, all of our social. Um, we, yeah, people like uh, other news outlets can publish our work for free under a Creative Commons license and also put the pitching guidelines if you all ever have stories, um, ideas or partnership ideas. Um, I am very excited about that. Uh, you know, we work a lot with um, uh, newer writers, younger writers, people that don't have J school experience. I think that that's really important too to diversify the voices in this industry. And there's again a huge push in that in in the um, in journalism as a whole. And I think that's incredibly important, especially in the South. Um, and so I encourage you to reach out if if you have any questions um, about that uh, or freelancing in general. Um, and I don't have my email on there, but I can put it in the chat. Um, so I think I'll stop there because I feel like I've been talking at you all forever and I will um, stop sharing my screen and hopefully there's questions. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. That was so, um, can you see me? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, well, thank you. That was so informative and inspiring. And I just want to say, like, as somebody who's not in in that field in journalism, it just like all I hear about um, journalism is consolidation and um, the the lack of like local reporting, whether it's news uh, paper or um, radio. Right, that there's just a lot of loss happening. So yeah. it it strikes me that you are really waging um, a, a really important battle um, and that I, I imagine it often feels like you're like constantly pushing that stone uphill and it's really important work. And I think you've convinced all of us of that. And um, I'm glad that you provided information, of, you know, links for people to read these stories and to share them and even pitch stories if they're interested. And, I just, I was gonna ask you to do that, how we can find you and learn more. So that's helpful. And I just wanted to add that people can also become members and, um, you know, support the work monetarily also, which is obviously really essential um, to keep that sustainability piece. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to, to pose questions as people share them and had just a few of my own to, to get us started. So. Yeah. Um, I'm really intrigued by the kind of solutions oriented approach that you take to journalism, which I think all of us would agree is refreshing, you know, and possibly a, a departure from a lot of the news that we, uh, we feel confronted by very often. It's sort of like unrelenting um, and bad, particularly when we are learning about environmental change and um, uh, environmental crises. So could you talk a little bit about that decision to um, to tell stories of uplift and people fighting back and uh, and collaborating to find solutions, um, how you find those stories and how you help to elevate them? Yeah, it's a that's a good question. I um, so 
it's funny because there's this whole like movement in journalism to called solutions journalism and in reality it's really just good journalism <laughs> like it's like looking at how people are responding to problems and if it's working or not like, at the very core that's what it is or and that's how I see it at least and um and examining those responses and, and solutions right to see like are, if they're policy or if they're technical or if they're engineering whatever it might be um to see what's working and what's not and what communities can learn from each other so one of the reasons I, I think I am drawn to that is because of a little bit what I talked about with connecting the dots between different places. Um, you know, with especially in the communities that we're covering, rural communities, communities of color, um, low income places, like they're just, as you might imagine, um, bogged down in terrible statistics and um, and stories that just highlight the challenges and um, and again can feel really isolated in their in their fight for whatever for justice for <laughs> health care for equality whatever it might be and I think that um, kind of putting flipping that on its head and looking at okay, yeah, but they're like in Georgia, for instance, like that organizing um, for the Senate had been going on for decades, right? And um, and it sort of was presented by a lot of places, I think is, oh, this just happened like crazy, you know? And seeing that, um, that these things have been going on for a long time, that people have been doing the work for a long time, maybe around like coal mining, for instance, in Appalachia, um, trying to move to a new, um, a new economy after coal has that that push has been happening for decades, um, despite what the, the typical narrative is. And um, similarly, you know, the Gulf Coast uh, with with oil and gas, it's sort of connecting the dots between those places to say, hey, it might not work exactly the same way um, on the coast as it does in the mountains, but we can learn from each other in like maybe um, a specific project or a way that something is funded or um, a policy proposal in a particular state. And so I think that that really resonates with me as um, as a way to move forward and to help people see that they're not so different, which um, which I think is is increasingly important, as you might imagine, in like the this media ecosystem that we're in, where we're all just like believing whatever uh, and, and, and ingesting the, um, the things that, that we align with. And so I think that if we can connect those dots better, it will help. Um, and then the other quick thing about solutions, I think is um, you know, one of the things I'm really proud of over the last year is we, uh, we highlighted a lot of work in um, uh, several tribes in coastal Louisiana on what they were doing during the pandemic because they had really low COVID rates and they were like, using practices that they had always used because they were pretty isolated and um, we're growing their own food, we're taking care of each other, uh, we're checking on each other. And it just sort of like helped prepare them for the year that, it, you know, 2020 was. Um, and it also sort of made space for them to um, focus on some like issues around sea level rise and how they're actually going to keep preparing for things like this happening in the future. Their homes are disappearing. Um, and so that was a really good example, I think, of of, um, of solutions oriented journalism that doesn't feel like fluffy or advocacy, right? We don't want that. It just feels like, hey, there's actual hope here. Here's what's happening. And I think we could all use some of that, honestly. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's really inspiring to, to see that your struggle is not uh, isolated necessarily. It has distinctive traits, to right. be sure, but that, you know, there is common cause with people across the region. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Thank you for that, um, Lindsay. So here's a question from um, Robert Sarnio. Uh, he says, pardon if you mentioned, uh, I don't think so. Um, can Southern-based schools of journalism play a role in advancing Southerly's remarkable work? Oh, that's so kind. Um, actually, yes. So I'm really interested in how um, universities, like I think the the alignment between universities and journalism in general is really interesting. And especially because it is such a hard industry to break into and to stay in. And if we could like create that pipeline more um, and, and like build a better foundation for that pipeline, I should say, I think that's really good. So we had an intern from like UNC last summer um, and we had, we've had a couple of like 
small relationships with Duke with some people, some students helping out. But um, yeah, like either sharing the work or um, collabing. Like I have, I've had students that have written stories for class that have pitched it to Southerly and like we've published it, um, you know, with some editing and all of that, but we published the work and paid them for it. And, you know, seen that like students can actually get your work published. <laughs> like, I feel like that's sort of a thing you don't think is possible when you're in college, but it is. And so, and then on the sort of bigger, I guess the broader scale, um, you know, any sorts of collaborations on projects or funding or, um, or like I said, internships, fellowships, that sort of thing, like very interested in all that. So you can give out my email address if you want. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that for sure. We'll be sure to um, maybe put that in the chat so folks have those links, but I think a related question about sort of training and recruiting, uh, this is mine and then there's some coming in, but I just wanted to ask, while we're on this topic, like how do you recruit and train local reporters? Because surely the best stories are kind of being told from the place where they're happening. So yeah. um, you mentioned some workshops and things, um, but how, how, how do you go about that? Yeah, it's, um, it's a challenge, especially for a place like, like we are reliant on freelancers and I wish that we had funding enough funding to hire people full time, you know, to say like, this person will, that's the goal, right, is to have someone based in Mississippi to be covering the Delta or something, or to have someone based in Kentucky to be covering Appalachia. But as of right now, we're just sort of relying on pitches coming in from whoever. Um, so we have some guidelines on our site for what we're looking for and pay and trying to be really transparent about that. And then, um, you know, we prioritize, you um, from the beginning, I've really tried to prioritize the stories being told from either by someone who's from there or lives there or has a really strong connection to there. And also um, increasingly is part of the community they're writing about. Um, so it is not so like outsider looking in. Um, so, and that means, um, I think the challenge is that historically, you know, journalism school and and job training in journalism has been for white people and prioritized white people and um, and men especially, um, but white people in general. And and so changing that is um, is difficult because it, it requires you know the like more on the job training. I think in terms of like freelancing. So we work with a lot of younger writers, newer writers, um, people who are just like, hey, I'm work in this community. I've seen this problem. Um, and I, I want to write about it. And, you know, we still are really careful with like conflict of interest. And if, um, you know, if they're the right person to tell that story, or maybe they should like be a source for that story, but um, really trying to train people as we go, which is not a sustainable <laughs> model um, for sure. But I think the workshop idea is really cool. Like we had this workshop and it was, uh, gosh, it was probably like 20 women, um, mostly black and indigenous women in North Carolina. And they just had passions, like a passion for environmental justice in their communities. And they were like, I wanna write about water. I wanna write about um, deforestation, whatever it might've been. And, um, and we just talked them through like public records requests and um, what it is to write, like a, how do you structure a story and how do you talk to sources and like, what does off the record mean? <laughs> and like that, that stuff I think is what we're, we're, more of that is really cool and important to actually like train the people that ha haven't had the chance maybe to go to journalism school or never thought that journalism was their thing until they saw something in their community. And they were like, well, dang, like this is not right. I wanna write about it. Um, so that makes me excited. And also I just hope that there's more resources for things like that in the future. Yeah, thank you. I like that idea of kind of grassroots reporting. Um, so more questions from the audience. This is from Dan Bromberg who asks, how much does an online publication like Inside Climate News engage in the kind of work you were doing at Southerly? How would you assess what it is doing, the areas where you overlap or differ? Yeah, um, I, funny enough, the guy that works, uh, this covers the South for Inside Climate News uh, lives in Louisville <laughs> too. He was an environmental reporter in Louisville for forever uh, for the news, Gannett newspaper here. Um, but I think, you know, that there's, a, there's just so much room for, for all of these publications. Sorry, my dog is outside barking and 
someone's supposed to stop her from barking. <laughs> in my office. I don't construction. <laughs> noise is welcome. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you know, there's there's plenty of room and there and there's so many different types of audiences that like all of these climate focused or environmental focused publications can can look at. And Inside Climate News is great because they're kind of doing this similar like regional model where they're covering different parts of the country. Um, but they're obviously doing a lot more like longer investigative work, data driven work, that sort of thing. Um, and we've republished a few of their stories and they've republished a few of ours, which is cool because they're both, um, you know, free to do that. And we've talked about collaborating at, a, you know, like a deeper level. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, where Southerly and other publications like us, like regional or local, are apart or are, are separate from that is that like, I'm... I've become increasingly uninterested in talking to people that already care about, <laughs> about what's like, they already know what's all happening. They're really invested. They're already like donating to all these environmental organizations. Like they're already got it, you know? And I need those people to give me money for sure. But, <laughs> but I, those are not the people I care about reaching um, more and more because they're not the ones that, um, you know, like actually need the information, you know, they, they, otherwise they would still have access to it. So I think that's where we sort of differ. But, um, but again, I think there's like, there's still so few environmental publications and it's really cool <laughs> to see that there's just plenty of room in the South and beyond to sort of cover all of that. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so here's a question from, from one of our students who's also a journalist. Um, Brittany Brown asks, how can reporters implement a solutions journalism lens in their own work? Any resources, suggestions, et cetera, on how to start? Yeah, that's great. So um, I should get commission from the Solutions Journalism Network from this, but they, um, they're like, they funded a lot of our work and it's been really awesome. Um, so the Solutions Journalism Network, um, I forgot, what the website is, but I can give it to you. Um, they have trainings and grants and, and money to like give out and they have examples of stories. They like track all these stories um, that are focused on solutions. And sometimes they're a little like rigid and like what they consider to be a solution story. Like I definitely see it as, you know, you, you look at a, you see a story, right? Like say, um, you, it, a story on like water quality in a particular place and um you see the problems like there are whatever contaminants in this place like the health there's these health risks that are happening blah 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 like you tell that story right and then in the next like if you're covering something consistently um you can look at kind of have this explainer piece and then you can kind of report out what the, how people are responding to that like are locals trying to pressure their government to do something is did like the local water district try some like thing to better the the water system did um is there are there grants that people are getting and and then you look at that and say okay is that working and it's still a solution story if it's not working right like it's very important for as journalists to examine that um that the fact that like yeah, it might be just a total dud, or it might be a lie, <laughs> or it might be, you know, just someone pushing their own agenda. Um, but it also, it, again, is, a, is something that people can learn from. And so, you know, and one of the things I, that I remember learning from solutions journalism was like um, the network, like they do trainings for newsrooms and also for just gen, um, independent journalists. And they talk a lot about looking outside of your region. So say you're writing about Mississippi. Well, if you see something happening similar in Oregon and you're like, okay, like what would that look like here? Did it work there and can it work here? Like that's a really good way to kind of connect the dots too. Um, so I think that those are all, um, those are all ways to look at it. And I encourage you to look at that, like their resources, um, but also just generally, I think the way to think about it is okay, yes, I know the problem. Like I've seen this well-documented, like what are people doing about it? And so we've tried to do that in every story. And sometimes it's still depressing and sometimes it's actually, you know, heartening. So it kind of depends, but. Right, that's a great resource. Thank you. And I think it is really interesting and in looking through your website, you know, there's a spectrum in terms of you know, some of the stories are mostly kind of despair with some yeah. hope and then some are you know kind of the opposite so I think every um 
problem has varying degrees of solution maybe embedded within it. Right. And like environmental stories, I think especially it's just like, it's really hard sometimes. Like it's just, you know, the, the way, the, the reason we're at the point that we are with like pollution or with climate change is because like nobody's done anything about it for decades. Right. And that's really depressing and hard to stomach sometimes. But um, I think where I sort of find the the bits of um, light are like what specific communities are doing. So like honing in on one place rather than being like, wow, this federal policy is not doing anything for anybody. <laughs> um, and so I think the more specific and narrow you can make it, I think it helps a little bit to start out. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, so here's a comment and question from Andrea Morales. She says, thank you for doing this, Lindsay. This is great. I wanted to know if you'd share a bit on how you decide your approach for any given story uh, need that you pursue. For example, when is it a 3K story? When is it explainer? When is it a workshop? I don't know what all those terms mean, but you probably do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. I, um, I feel like part of it, I just know in a sense because I've been doing it for a while. Um, I did not have any like ed, like, real editing experience before I started Southerly. Um, I sort of was trained like a little bit in newsrooms and um, and I feel like I just have a good knack for like what makes a, a good story and um, and reporting is really where my heart's at. So um, take this with a grain of salt, that is all to say. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think oftentimes in journalism, people, including me, think that the story needs to be way longer than it does. <laughs> and um, so oftentimes it's just asking like, okay, what do you really need to tell this story? Like, we don't need every single detail. It's not like a historical document, you know, like what can we, what do we need to know now? How does it further, one question I always ask is like, how does this further the conversation? You know, if it's been written about a lot, there might be a new angle, but it might just be like 500 words or, you know, a couple minutes of a, like um, uh, radio story or whatever it is just to give updates or um, kind of analyze something that's happened. Um, I think where I really like to dig in to stories is when it hasn't been covered at all. Um, we covered this um, um, story in North Carolina about, uh, this was several years ago, but about um, cancer clusters that were happening around um, in this, only like among young women. Um, and it was ocular melanoma and eye cancer. And they were getting really sick. And like the moms got really upset. It hadn't been written about very much. And the moms got really upset and were like pushing for answers. So they like got a, a researcher to come in and test the water and test the soil and try to figure out where it was coming from. And it turns out that they're really suspicious of contaminants from not just like nuclear sites, but also coal ash in the area. Um, and it, like, we couldn't prove that, but like, it was worth using a huge long story and photos and everything to show like, this is what these families have been through. Um, this is what they're trying to do about it, uh, that sort of thing. And, and I think that those things that have not been covered are, are really awesome to see. And then now more and more, I'm trying to look at stories um, and I'm learning so much from um, other people in this industry doing this work, like Sarah Alvarez at Outlier or, um, um, Alicia Bell at um, Free Press in North Carolina. And, um, you know, making sure that when we're doing a story, we're thinking about it in terms of like, okay, how is this useful to people? So like what, you know, this, this newsletter idea, it's like, well, if I started a publication in rural North Carolina, like I could not cover that consistently. So like a monthly newsletter fits their needs and people were interested in that. Or um, maybe we can just do like this zine for um, hurricane recovery just before the next hurricane season comes around to hand out um, just for like the specific resources that people need in that moment. Um, and so I'm trying to think of it more like that so that um, so that it's actually useful to the people that um, that will act will will get it um, and is not just kind of for vanity's sake like being a beautiful story, which I still love those, but sometimes you just have to be like, okay maybe that's not the most useful. <laughs> so hopefully yeah. that sort of answers it. I like that kind of context specific is how you would approach things. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so staying with that theme of things that are maybe not the most beautiful, this question, <laughs> um, anonymous attendee asks, um, 
What do you think is the most disconcerting element or thing which you felt observed uh, about the contemporary South? Oh God. Um, uh, contemporaries, I guess the, hopefully this answers this, but the thing that bothers me the most, that makes me the most angry and keeps me up at night is, is really, um, I mean, there's a lot of things, don't get me wrong. The South makes me really mad, <laughs> but, um, one of the things is is like the the concerted effort constantly to keep people in the dark about what's happening, like to keep people misinformed and and intentionally make sure that they don't know um, how something is harming them or how it is disproportionately harming them, um, and that's always ha always has to do with race, and that always has to do with um, you know socioeconomic status. And no matter what story it is, um, no matter what issue it is, like <laughs> it, it intersects with those things. Um, it, and that's always at the heart. And, um, and it's just so frustrating to like see a region have so much potential and to be so beautiful and wonderful and like have people really pushing for things that they want and to have the people in power doing that. And like that, it just kills me. And I don't, you know, I can't solve that all by myself, but I, know that um I know that bothers a lot of people so I try to think of it like okay what can I do in like a little corner of that to try to impact it um but I think that probably bothers me the most lately yeah yeah it's an enduring uh, challenge and um I think the fact that your organization kind of puts environmental justice at the that's kind of the node from which all of the other topics which are climate, health, justice, energy, land, water, and culture, like that those are all circulating, but at the root is struggle, essentially. Environmental justice is a movement that exists because of environmental injustice, right? So I think, yeah, I, I'm with you in feeling despair at the same, and holding that at the same time that we hold some semblance of hope. And um, so, um, all right, it doesn't look like there are any more questions from um, from the audience. So I just, I wanna give you the last word, Lindsay. Is there anything else that was not asked that you would like to share with us today? Um, um, no, I'm just, I'm so excited to be able to talk about this. I feel like I'm learning constantly <laughs> about um, from people who are much more brilliant than me, have been doing this longer than me. And it's just, um, and people who are like innovating in journalism and, and storytelling. And it's just really cool to be able to like learn out loud <laughs> and um, and think through this stuff with, with you all. And so if anyone ever has ideas or, you know, topics or if like I'm an open book and I would love to talk. Um, so like my email's in the, in the chat. So feel free to reach out and thank you all. Thank you so much, Lindsay. On behalf of everyone who's here today and the center and the journalism school, we're really grateful to you for this insightful presentation. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, so thank you. Um, Afton has put some information in the chat about upcoming events, so we hope you all can join us for those. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.